website, which is uh, where we draw most of our uh, audience from, in, in this uh, uh, case at least, uh, one of the problems that we had is uh, the, the location. I think that's why not that many people showed up. But let's go ahead and, uh, and get started. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would like to introduce to you uh, Mr. Uh, Roy Eichhorn, who's going to talk to us about uh, the so-called ghost army uh, of World War II. Roy is the former director of research and development of the Army Management Staff College at Fort Belvoir, Virginia. He has spent more than 30 years with the Army and across DOD in uh, teaching, research and consulting. Roy has done extensive research on US military deception, has contributed to three books on the subject, and was a research and advisor for the Ghost Army documentary film, which first appeared on uh, PBS. Uh, he, was the, he uses the Ghost Army for educational case studies in both creativity and leadership, and provides consulting on deception to Army and other government organizations. Roy's Army engineer roots uh, go back to the Civil War, where his great-great-grandfather served in the 1st New York Volunteer Engineer Regiment. He has also a personal collection, connection to the Ghost Army. Uh, his stepfather, uh, George Martin, was a deception artist in the 6th or 3rd uh, Camouflage Engineer Battalion and was also assigned as the battalion photographer shortly before D-Day. So some of the pictures we'll see today were actually taken uh, uh, by his uh, uh, stepfather. Roy has a BA and MA degree in anthropology. He holds a graduate certificate in defense and strategic studies from Missouri State and is a graduate of both the Army Command and General Staff College and the Army Management Staff College's Sustaining Base Leadership and Management Program. Uh, he's a licensed fixed wing pilot and holds certificates as a dive master, a master scuba diver, and as an underwater uh, archaeologist. And in the next hour or so, uh, it will become apparent to you that the uh, engineers uh, of the Ghost Army were true innovators and problem solvers, very much uh, uh, like the engineer predecessors and the engineers of tomorrow, which we obviously here uh, to support and uh, to educate. Um, so without further ado, uh, I hereby uh, present to you uh, Mr. Roy Alcorn with the uh, Engineering Deception. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. It is um, truly a delight to be back in the engineer world. Uh, I have not been back here on Fort Leonard Wood since uh, about 2010. Um, great to see all the things that have changed so I can't find my way around anymore. Um, I'm going to focus a lot on the engineers for this, uh, in part because that's kind of my interest and in yours. Uh, but don't forget the signal people because this is a, an all um, signature kind of an organization. That's part of what made it unique. That was produced as part of a package. Um, one of the uh, uh, congresswoman from New Hampshire uh, put forth a bill in Congress six years ago to award a congressional gold medal to the Ghost Army collectively. We've been working on it six years. We have, um, I think, probably been in every congressional and Senate office on the Hill. Uh, about three weeks ago, the House passed their bill. So we are now uh, much more focused on the Senate. We currently have 19 Senate co-sponsors, um, and we're, we're down to 11 surviving veterans. So we're hoping to uh, get that through. Uh, and the families are very interested in it. The men were told to kept, keep, <coughs> excuse me, keep quiet for 51 years. Think about all these adventures and everything else. And many of them died without ever telling their families a thing. Their families, if they knew anything, dad was in the war. Dad was at Fort Belvoir or Fort Meade. Dad was an engineer. That was like it. And so as families are discovering what their fathers or grandfathers had done, that's part of what the, the motivation has been for us to uh, get this stuff out. It starts with the Joint Psychological Warfare Committee. Again, one of those obscure things most people don't know about. Um, looking at deception as being something we needed to do. And this is only five months after Pearl Harbor, but already we're understanding that um, we need space to maneuver, and part of what deception does is gives you that. 
The concept of the 23rd Special Troops was originally um, claimed to be the idea of uh, Major Ralph Ingersoll. Ingersoll was a journalist, he was the editor of Life magazine, um, and he decided to sign up. Uh, he is considered the father of photojournalism. What he had done is he had been in North Africa with General Devers of the American Army, and uh, Ingersoll saw the deception work that the British were doing. And so he claimed, he took it back, and you know, very inventive, and he put it together and he sold it. Well, a couple things are wrong. The first is, if you're there as a major with a four-star general, and the four-star general sends the note saying, hey, we need to do this, who probably gets credit for it? <laughs> probably General Devers. Um, but the other thing is that what Ingersoll observed was the British taking three generations of experience from the American Civil War. A lot of the tactics that you have here come from the, uh, particularly the work of Stonewall Jackson. The Valley Campaign is uh, one of the things that I've done with the command group from PSYOP, which continues the deception business. And in your, in your book, Essay On, which I, I just recently got, so I haven't read the whole thing, and I will not, I probably won't survive a quiz. But here on page 76, we talk about this fellow that goes and talks to Stonewall Jackson. And uh, his name is Hitchcock, or uh, sorry, Hatchworth. And Hotchkiss is told, I want you to make me a map of the valley from Harper's Ferry to Lexington, showing all the points of offense and defense in those places. So Hotchkiss becomes the topographic engineer first for Stonewall Jackson and then for Lee for the rest of the war. Jackson's Valley campaign is absolutely amazing from a military standpoint. He takes what he's gotten from his topographical engineer. He takes what he knows as a tactical and operational commander and he merges the two and then adds deception. The Valley campaign is one that I would commend to you because with a force that never exceeded 1,100 soldiers, Stonewall Jackson engaged and defeated three Union armies. So he was able to use the terrain and work it in ways that, that made all that come together. So what Ingersoll sees and what Devers sees is in fact what a British officer in 1875, he found surviving members of Jackson's staff, wrote up a very detailed thing and he particularly, he boiled down the concepts of deception. Those were learned by successive generations of German, off, or of uh, British officers, sorry, I was looking, <laughs> thinking of home. Um, but they, uh, they did it in the Boer War, they did it in World War I, and so he's, commander in, in North Africa is wandering around making statements and his men thought he was perhaps going a little crazy but in fact what he was doing is he's wandering around in the North African desert quoting Stonewall Jackson. That was lost on the Americans and so as far as they knew this was this great British thing and they were going to go one better and create a unit and the unit would have to be initially it was visual so they said okay what should this unit be and the, I'm going to get this wrong again. There we go. So they came up and said, okay, we need a camouflage battalion as the core unit. And the Army had created what uh, I refer to as the 600 series, 601, 602. So 603 was selected out of the other camouflage battalions to be the core element. And then they said, we also need combat engineers because we're going to be right up on the front line, we're going to need security, we're also going to have to build things, we're going to have to do revetments as part of the, you know. And so the 406th Engineer Combat, uh, Company Combat, was taken from the Desert Maneuvers. It was the best engineer company of the, uh, that cycle in the Desert Maneuvers, and they were added. They were both basically TO&E units at the time. As time went on, they then added a signal service company 
and finally the 3132, which is specifically designed for sonic uh, deception. I'm not going to speak much about them. Uh, we're, we've got a movie we're doing in Branson uh, on the 6th in the IMAX theaters. Uh, that'll go into a lot more of the signal stuff as well. So the basic idea starts coalescing in December of 1943. And the guy in the center is Colonel Billy Harris. And he is designated the deception officer for the European theater. Harris does two things. One is he puts together a report and says, we need operational level deception. And it needs to be visual, and it needs to be signal, and it needs to be able to portray two divisions. He also gets moved over to the first U.S. Army group, which is often referred to as Patton's Fake Army. I didn't realize until I started getting into all this uh, research, it wasn't entirely fake. So first U.S. Army group, in fact, is building the operational cadre for the 12th Army group, which will go into combat later on after the, the initial invasion. The, the only unit created specifically for FUSAG was the 3103rd uh, Signal Battalion, and that was strategic deception, primarily. So Eisenhower, actually Devers for Eisenhower, sends to General Marshall a note, December 30, or 43, that says, create this. And all in one shot, he, the, you can, again, walk the dog, and look at force generation. We still do it the same way today. He's got a mission needs statement, an operational requirements document. He goes through all the solution sets, doctrine, training, organization, leadership, uh, materiel. Uh, in the old days we used S for soldiers. I guess now it's personnel and facilities. Um, and also the uh, startings of uh, qualitative and quantitative personnel record inventory. So this is all being done and then what he tells the the person assigned to command create, it, create this unit. At the time, the Army has no doctrine, no real experience base. They've, gotten, they've got a couple of TO&E units, mostly engineers, and um, no idea of how to do it. So they're building it on the fly and oh, by the way, your operational requirement is have it ready in England by 15 May. They get the, the word on 22 January, 44. So they've got that short four and a half month period to create the whole thing, organize it, get it all worked out and get it to England. So what happens initially, uh, again, this is fairly recent breaking news. Um, we're, we've, the last big dump of declassification was 2012, but there are still things we keep finding because they were put aside, lost, or deliberately misplaced. So the 23rd Special Troops, the Ghost Army, is assigned to 1st U.S. Army Group, and they do training exercises. But one of their training exercises is Operation Cabbage, and they are doing an all-source electromagnetic spectrum, visual, everything, portraying a complete uh, armored division. So that is going on prior to the D-Day invasion in Patton's first U.S. Army Group area. After the invasion and with the breakout into France, Operation Cobra, July 14th, what they do, Bradley, who has been in on this from the beginning, is moved down to command 12th Army Group. They then take that whole deception package that is in FUSAG headquarters and migrate that into 12th Army Group. So now they're up and running and then 3rd Army is given to Patton and they move it out and put General McNair in place because they want to keep the 1st U.S. Army Group deception going. You don't want to suddenly stop a deception and then the enemy goes, oh wait a minute, that was a fool, so I gotta go do this. So they kept up the pressure about an invasion going into the Pas de Calais area for quite a while. Now, unfortunately for General McNair, General McNair, as the FUSAG commander, had to go forward and he is observing, and he is seen to be observing, the attack on St. Lowe. 
And unfortunately, that was an attack where we had uh, we were using strategic bombers to do tactical bombing, and it didn't go well. And so General McNair is the highest ranking and first deception soldier to be killed in, in World War II. So here's the operational timeline. First, Ghost Army personnel are engineers, and they are in on Omaha and Utah Beach on D-Day, H hour plus six. Originally, they were assigned to do a deception operation called Q-lighting, where as it got dark, they were gonna change lights around so that they would attract attention to where the lights were as opposed to where the real operation were. But they, they got there and the, the beach is so crowded and everything, that's pointless. Um, and they go ahead and they work with folks uh, doing the camouflage job. First radio operation goes in day one, uh, was called Trout Fly, never executed as Trout Fly. And then another group of engineers comes in from the 603rd and they come in behind Omaha Beach on D-Day plus 10 and they start doing artillery simulations. Uh, the artillery simulations, for a while we've known that they did it. Uh, the question was how. And a family member sent last November, sent us a hand-drawn chart and what the soldiers were doing is they were taking combinations of gasoline and black powder, varying them, putting them in their own containers and putting squibs in there to shoot them off. And they had studied what gun flashes looked like from cannon, from tank, from howitzers, from heavy guns. And so they adjusted that to make the right amount of bang and flash and smoke. But they're whipping this stuff on their own. They, they didn't get pre-made, um, charges of any sort until late in the game, and they never got them for the tanks. So whenever they had to simulate tank fire, they were always brewing up their own. My dad said that was sometimes dicey. So you've got all these very highly trained radio people there, and so D plus five, the radios for the 82nd Airborne went into the water, um, but they lost about 90%, and so Instead of being deceivers, these guys go up on the front lines and they are the 82nds Airborne for the first month of the invasion. Full operations doesn't start till 1 July. Sonic deception added in 44. Um, I'm going to talk more about special effects, but the soldiers after each operation, uh, one of the things that I was blessed with, if you will, they G the S3 of the Ghost Army survived for a long time, and he became my mentor, and I, he would call me up when I was at Fort Belvoir and say, hey, have you ever thought about, it's like, really? Hmm, no. What can you tell me? And um, they conducted what we would today call an AAR after every operation. And as he pointed out, he said, we made mistakes. We never made the same one twice. And so they're learning in the field and evolving in the field. They're changing equipment, they're changing tactics, technique, and procedure as they go, based on contact with the enemy. They also, it's only a few men involved, but they had a stay behind unit during the Battle of the Bulge, and they sat in a hole for two weeks, 24 seven, relaying messages between Bradley's headquarters and places like Bastogne. So Bastogne was never actually cut off from communication. Bradley was always able to talk to him. But because there wasn't enough juice in the phone lines, Bradley would call these two privates sitting in a hole. They'd take down the message, hook up to another one of these damaged uh, lines, ring up Bastogne and say, Bradley says, and then they'd get the answer and call back Bradley. And this is going on back and forth in a bombed out phone exchange in Luxembourg that is surrounded by German troops. And occasionally the German troops use the front undamaged part of the building to get out of the rain, to cook a meal or what. So they are very, very close. And I asked, I asked the, one of the guys who's a survivor, um, I said, wow, you did all this, uh, you know, and you kept it all secret, humma humma. I said, uh, what happened, you know, when you got out? He said, well, they came and picked us up after two weeks of doing this. And uh, we were glad they did. We were pretty beat and living in a hole together. And uh, they took us to meet General Bradley. Oh, cool, because we've been talking to him for <laughs> two weeks. And uh, so then what? He said, well, he promoted us on the spot to PFC. 
That's it. No further recognition. Only minor note here and there in the official history. The final piece, which I'll talk about in more detail because it was a, not a big one, but it was important to them and very engineer heavy, was uh, displaced person handling. So if you want to build a camouflage and deception unit, what do you do? They went back to a regulation from the 1920s that they had learned from the French. And they said, you want people that are good at fooling the eye. You want artists and designers. You also want people that are good as actors. So they got people that did radio plays. And uh, then they filled that in with sort of standard MOS billets to handle the, the vehicles and motor pools and such. But they also, because they were going to be forward, got additional weapons and explosives training. Sometimes if you read about the ghost army or somebody makes a comment and says, oh, they didn't have any guns, da 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 da, that's not true. <laughs> uh, I've dug out the TOEs and some of the other information plus interviews. Um, for the size unit they were, they were, they were very, very over heavy on uh, 50 cal and 30 caliber machine guns. Uh, they also had lots of explosives uh, and were trained on how to use them. And um, they also picked up things as they went. So my, uh, my dad had a bazooka uh, with, in his truck that he, he carried along and picked up more shells as he went. So they, they, they did that additive thing that wasn't in the, in the, the uh, design. But to become deceivers, the camoufleurs became uh, or changed about 40, up to 40% of their organization. This is what they started with. This was standard engineering practice at the time, World War I flat tops. Uh, and there you can see they're, they're building it, and then you'd open it up to fire the gun through. You fired the gun, put the gun down, flip the flap top back, and it was pr primarily designed against aerial observation. They built these things from scratch, basically. They were given wire and netting, uh, but not nets as we have them. They had individual strips of cloth. They came 50-foot rolls or about that wide, and they would have to weave them in to get the pattern that they wanted. A lot of these, uh, actually all the artists have been trained in cubism, going back to uh, the French Impressionists, or the uh, French Modernists. And the way these things work is not necessarily the pattern on the top. It's when the sun hits them, what those pieces of cloth do is they break up the sunlight coming down through and it breaks up the image underneath to a point where the eye can't get the brain to put it back together. And that's basically cubism. Think uh, Picasso. They also got basic engineering training. Um, my dad's comment on that was funny in that he said, okay, go get your own lumber. He said, these are artists from New York City and Philadelphia. They've never used an ax, and they've got to build a bridge. Um, but they did. Um, he said they were happy to get out of there because they weren't too sure that farmer was going to like how well the bridge was built. But that's, just, I think, the old bridge there in the left. Originally, they were told, OK, now you're deceivers. You're going to have to build decoys. They could build them. Again, they had wire and string and saplings that they would collect around. Um, they put uh, fabric on it called Osnaberg, which is like a finer version of burlap, and they painted it. And they would paint different patterns on it. In this case, they just started. Problem here is nobody in the unit had ever seen an artillery piece. So they were working for pictures, and they didn't know the scale of it. So they if you actually see a couple of other pictures where the soldiers are standing next to them, these things are huge. Um, but it's all in proportion. It's just not to scale. And the other thing is they discovered that the bigger you made it, some of the pieces were easier because you could bend stuff more easily in a, a larger circle. So while this is going on, some other things are happening in the engineer world. This is uh, guys starting to build from saplings a uh, two and a half ton truck frame, which they will then 
net out with their fabric and stuff that they've got. And this was what they were expecting to do when they got to Europe. They didn't have anything else. Well, what else is going on? The engineer camouflage laboratory at Fort Belvoir is experimenting with something else. They had tried rigid frames. This is what they settled on, which was an inflatable. Those folks don't know it yet. And they're still working some kinks out, and they're trying to get these things into production. And there are a whole series of production issues and production creations that have to be done to make it happen. They also, uh, this is the first instance I found, that is 1944, roughly February of 1944, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is a drone. They had remote controlled aircraft, they were used for anti-aircraft training, um, but they were fully, fully operational, I mean, they flew just fine. The concepts were taken from that and applied to B-17s that were then used, filled with explosives and used as giant flying bombs. So the visual deception got better and better and the uh, camouflage lab started sending these things out to them as they were getting produced. There were several models of some of them. Uh, probably my, one of my favorites is the bottom right hand corner. That's an observation plane all done out of inflated rubber with cloth coverings. Here's one of the things you learn. Say you have a, a tank and you want to do deception. Well, I can inflate a tank on my front lawn and somebody's going to come by and go, hey, there's something that looks like a tank on your front lawn. It's not going to convince anyone. The airplane is an example. Really quickly, they realized you can't just inflate an airplane and say, here are my spotter planes for this unit. You have to have a logical looking place for it to take off and land from. And you need a windsock. And you need them arrayed in protective, uh, according to protective doctrines so that they can't be shot up as easily. So actually your inflatable airplane becomes a whole series of decisions you have to make. And that's where the combat engineers come in because uh, they help them get this stuff out. Now, how good were they? They were so good, real airplanes landed on their airstrips. And they were told, go away, go away, go away. This is another model of the tank. The one you saw in the first clip was actually a, a final model. But they're getting better, they're getting more realistic. And they would cover them with nets, which again are breaking up the outline, and they were pretty good at calculating what the brain would process and what someone would see. And uh, they worked out fairly well. They had 800 and over 800 inflatable dummies to go, on out, go out and portray two divisions. Um, can you drop the light for a moment? OK. Notice anything about the picture? I'm sorry? It looks like they added in ruts for the tank tracks. Yeah, they've got ruts for the tank tracks. And in fact, they have different ruts for the tanks than they do for the trucks. <laughs> I have a question. You don't just put the tank up. You have to have a track leading to where it stopped. Yes? Will they ever use this tactic again, do you believe, in the future? I'm sorry? Will they ever use this tactic again in the future, do you believe? That's a really good question, because a lot of uh, other forces do this stuff. We don't. In fact, we stopped doing it uh, about 1992, the last of the 82nd Airborne's um, battlefield deception detachments uh, were dismembered. But everything on there except the buildings and the road is fake. So if you're coming over doing an observation, I'd be worried about that if I, you know, and again, they will cover that over later and they will disguise some of them a little less effectively. But the bottom line is, yeah, you know, it works out pretty well. They also d developed what they called special effects. These were created by the soldiers themselves, and they went up the line to get permission to do them. So here you have them redecorating one of their Jeeps to become an MP Jeep 
for the 90th Infantry Division. So one of the things you see people read about and soldiers griping during World War II, they have to take off their uh, combat, their patches, or they have to black out their bumpers. Well, that was so that these guys could do that. And then over there, what you see are fake patches. They created a factory unit in the uh, 603rd Engineers, and all, every one of those is fake. Uh, and they, they needed to standardize on something, so they're made on shelter half cloth. So it was a uniform thickness, and they got used to working with it. The factory section within the 603rd produced over 40,000 patches in, in nine months. On the left is the patch my dad wore for Operation Viersen, 79th Infantry. Uh, that's crossing of the Rhine deception. Uh, on the right is the real patch. But part of what they discovered is that, okay, if you have the two together like that, somebody's going to say, well, one of them's different. But if you have 100 soldiers all in full gear, and they're all wearing the patch on the left, aha. Part of the reason that this becomes a bigger deal, if you will, and it was added later. Uh, by the way, this also included impersonating officers. Uh, so you have sergeants wearing two stars and driving around in a general's jeep with guards front and back, and they'll roll into town on some poor unsuspecting unit and, you know, get them lined up. Hey, where are you from, son? Uh, that really happened. And uh, in fact, we found that there is a secret um, film that was created, and one of the things they show as uh, a case where the sergeant shows up and, and he's doing the whole thing and at the very end he takes off his coat and he's back to being a sergeant. Um, one of the people I interviewed who uh, became, uh, actually he was the highest ranking officer afterward, he was uh, 18 months out of West Point and he was captain commanding the combat engineers. And they said, we need to find somebody that can pull off being a regimental commander. Reb, you look like the guy. Okay. So with, per with permission from headquarters, he puts on eagles. They set up a fake command post for him. They run wires into it because a command post has lots of wires going in back in the day. And the, the cool part was he used his own company, first sergeant and some of his other people to staff his office. And some officer from some other unit would come bustling in, ticked off, whatever, wanted to talk to the regimental commander. And they walk in, and here's a guy that was three years junior to them at West Point. He said no one ever asked him how he became a colonel so fast. But they all asked his first sergeant, who was primed to answer, hey, wartime, you know, the Army does things, right time, right place. And they'd go out muttering. Reb would ultimately become a major general and he was the uh, uh, chief of military construction. So were those, were those patches, they were worn for enemy deception? I'm sorry? They were worn for enemy deception, so they would go out and then be seen? In, in part, yeah. And it, so that if it, um, there's been an argument about, um, well, you've got all this stuff, but the Luftwaffe is not doing too well at this point in time. Um, you're, you're putting on a show for no good reason, probably won't do any good. The answer to that comes actually from uh, research uh, published a few years ago by uh, Sunke Neitzel in Germany. And it turns out that there was a system in place as the German army retreated. The SS would leave an officer and a senior NCO in each village town whose job it was to collect people that would become the basis for an insurgency. And the British caught it on uh, audio with two Germans that had been captured talking to each other and they got the detail on it. So yes, there were stay behind agents and it was organized. And because the German army was retreating backward, they were retreating onto their own lines of communication. They had telephone communication town by town by town going back. And so one of the things the Ghost Army did, uh, they, they sent people behind the lines to disrupt the phone communication to stop that one, two. Um, it forced the German Army to go more radio and we could intercept their radio. So part of, part of it was disruption for 
disrupting the intelligence part. Part of it was to get more radio traffic. So here's the camo lab again. And this is what one of those two and a half ton trucks looks like undressed. Again, they're thinking of shape and form and color. If you just look at the skeleton, it looks like a balloon party, you know, where people are making balloon animals. But once you cover it and paint it, and they did a lot of the painting in the field. Some of it was issued that way. Initially, they had to paint their own stuff. Um, and at a distance, and you put some trees there, uh, looks pretty good. They also discovered early on that when you're mimicking, you want to be a deceiver. You want to make it look like you are a unit. What do units have? They have logistics. So you can't just put out tanks, you can't just put out howitzers. If you're, a, if you're imitating a, uh, an armored division, as a minimum, an armored division ate 15,000 gallons of gas a day. You have to have fuel haulers. And so, again, you'll read here stories of soldiers griping about, we pulled in and we stopped for two hours at this stupid place, and then we went, you know, no good reason, we should have been home for chow. They were there, in many cases, to be a part of a deception. So you would run the full fuel haulers in, stop it, proceed to the real unit, empty the fuel haulers, come back, and now a stay-behind agent sees full tanker trucks going forward into the deception area and returning X hours later, as it, they should, empty. And they know they're not going to pour the stuff out on the ground. So that builds part of it. Again, if you have tanks in a unit, uh, even an infantry division has tanks, um, you have to have a tank recovery vehicle. So this is the engineer lab's version of it. You see two folks on the right there, bottom right-hand corner. They're putting some trees up to see what, again, what happens when you break it up with light. That's what it really looks like. Again, it's just a series of balloons banded together, covered with balloon cloth, and painted. This is my favorite series, and I'm just going to show you a couple. But that's a, a landing craft tank. And look at, the, look at the vehicles that are sorted on there. This is off of uh, either Castle Point or White Stone Point uh, at Belvoir in the river. Um, Every vehicle on there is a fake. The tank, well, it's not the best tank yet, but the trucks and the other equipment, particularly when photographed from the air, look good. If you're on the shore on the uh, Prince William County side and you're looking at it, they look really good. Here's the cool part. The landing craft is also a fake. The engineer uh, labs came up with this uh, we sent a hundred of them to the British. They were called, the Brits called them Big Bobs because they float, you know, bobbed around. But look at the detail, and by the time you put it together and paint it up a little bit, it looks pretty good. And so one of the things that we had discovered when the um, Germans were preparing for the invasion of Britain, we were counting the number of landing barges that were added each week. And we knew, we could guesstimate, how much can you put in a landing barge? And that was making the British very, very nervous. And so down the road, they said, well, what if we add landing barges for part of our strategic deception? So that also comes out of the engineer lab, although the Ghost Army itself used all the vehicles, but not the big boat. This is just a representation. Um, this is from the official history. And on the south, you see the dark colored or blacked in units, those are real units. The furthest real unit north is a cavalry squadron. The area that is not covered by troops is 50 miles. The only thing between the entire German army and Paris at that point is the ghost army and their rubber dummies. Normally they, they are the sixth uh, armored division at that point. Normally they tried to not have a deception run for very long, maybe three, four days, ideally. 
Because Patton was still engaged around Metz, he couldn't send any more real combat power north. So his entire line up there for that 50 mile strip is that one cavalry squadron and the fake 6th Armored. This is from Operation Viersen, designed to pull forces away from the Rhine, uh, the Rhine crossing. And it gives an example of how they do it, or did it. The blue are, lines are for real units, and they're coming out of Echt in Holland. And they come out from Dulken, then they go north at Viersen. And they black out at this point. They, they, they cover their bumpers, they pull off their patches, and up they go. In the meantime, the Ghost Army is coming in behind them with their stuff painted the same way. So you see a stream of trucks that are all showing the 79th or the 30th Division. And as they go out of sight, they change, and these 30th Division guys come in, and they look exactly the same. And so what they succeeded in doing, and this was full everything, this was sonic, uh, special effects, you name it, uh, real fires, and they're, they're set out for that crossing. And so real units, real German units, line up south of Duisburg and come ready for the attack from here. The entire 9th Army goes across the Rhine, expecting upwards of 10, maybe 15,000 casualties for the full army crossing. And their full casualty count is about, if I remember correctly, about 360. So uh, this is one of the places where you could say exactly how many lives got saved. Well, but if you take a whole army across the last defensive frontier of an enemy who's really still pretty good, and you do it with that low a percentage, that's that's doing pretty good. And this is their, their bigger, biggest and best. Uh, you can put the lights on again if you would. Oh, I'm sorry. Could you take it down just one? This is another one of the, everything there except the buildings and the real road is uh, deceptive material. This is part of the deception for Viersen. Okay, thanks. The last mission was a weird one. They had finished with Operation Viersen. The 9th Army is across the Rhine. Some of the Ghost Army units are moving forward, and they get as far as Czechoslovakia, actually. And, um, but the Army has a problem. As they are moving forward, they're starting to liberate concentration camps and forced labor camps. And there are all these people in there, some of whom are right on the edge of falling over dead with disease or starvation. The Army has civil affairs and military government troops, but not many. And none of them are trained for this. So they looked around and they said, who have we got? Oh, we've got these engineers. They set up camps and, uh, in fact, one of the things that happens is the combat engineers commander establishes a precedent which we use today. The people in the camps, they're liberated, right? You should be happy. Wrong. They're trying to kill each other. The Poles and the Russians are going at it. Uh, the Serbs are not happy with other folks. And so uh, Captain, at that point, Reb, separates them by nationality. So each camp becomes predominantly one or at least nationalities that don't want to kill each other immediately. You've got a complete breakdown of law and order and health and safety because as the, the army moves out, you've got all these people that have nothing. And so they go in and they establish portable water points. That's one of the things the combat engineers had extra water point gear. Uh, so they put up water points. They fix up sanitation and establish sanitation. The engineers go out in various ways and acquire food off the local um, economy in various ways. Probably my favorite is there was, were no-go zones around the camps. And where does wildlife go under pressure? Goes where nobody's hunting it. And so the guys would take submachine guns and they would go out and hunt deer. Uh, there were a group of them from Pennsylvania National Guard Unit. And they would go out and hunt deer and bring them back and they would butcher them there in the camps and feed the prisoners. Um, 
Ultimately, you have about 700 engineers, mostly, um, taking care of over 100,000 people. So, as my dad said, congratulations, you now have 150 starving sick people. Take care of them. Um, in the official history, they, they took a, took a uh, poll, 29 languages were spoken. Now, the upside of it was they, there were a lot of first generation and immigrants in the unit, and so they actually could speak to, they had somebody that could communicate with folks in there. They didn't have anybody that couldn't. So in final tally for the operation, 21 major deceptions, five propaganda missions, which we, they were told not to do, uh, but then told to do. Uh, they conducted behind the lines missions to do both disruption and intelligence. Probably, I've heard figures as high as 40,000 American lives, probably somewhere in the 15 to 30,000 lives saved is a reasonable one. And uh, also caring for and protecting over 100,000 of the uh, concentration and labor camp survivors. If they saved 1% of those people that were dying like flies from what they did, okay, there's 1,000 people saved per percentage point. Uh, and if you look at that period of history, it looks very much like the sort of thing you might see in Iraq or you might see in Afghanistan. So there are lessons learned here. And finally, the other thing that they did, which was an odd one because some of the soldiers responded to it very, very well. Other soldiers were not so happy about it. Um, because Russian soldiers were attacking German civilians, particularly if they were in more isolated locations, the Ghost Army was sending out units, and everyone I've identified was an engineer unit. Um, guys that had never shot, fired their weapon in anger, are now shooting at Russians. Um, and interesting to read and discuss some of that. This was some of the, one of the things that affected my, my dad pretty seriously, and this was part of what caused, caused me to start digging into it. Because nowhere could I find some of the stuff on these operations. And it turns out that um, Ghost Army soldiers, and particularly a couple of the officers, really put themselves at huge risk to make sure people didn't get killed when the Russians got their hands on them. So there are a lot of polls that are alive today because uh, Lieutenant Colonel Cliff Simonson deliberately violated his orders again and again and again, and lie cheated and stole and hid these people all over until we could say, oh, we lost, these guys are dead, these guys escaped, whatever. And they never got back to the Soviets. And I actually got to meet the sons and grandsons of these Polish soldiers when I was in, serving in Germany. And it was really cool because it was like, wow, that's how you got here. And they stayed. So let's, I want to talk a little bit about the soldiers themselves. And again, I'm going to focus on the engineers. Um, this was done for some uh, uh, families with children, small children, uh, that simply had been abandoned as the German army pushed out. And um, that's a comment from uh, Jim Laubheimer on the uh, 603rd. And it, I guess I didn't think about it, you know, but the, the additional line was what caught me. Half the guys in that group were Jewish. And they're all singing Christmas carols because that's what these kids need. And they also, because a lot of them are artists, they drew. So the soldiers got together and they made um, goodie kits for the kids and for the families. Because um, truly nothing, so a bottle of aspirin was like a big deal. And, uh, but there was one little guy that uh, um, Vic Dowd from the 603rd drew. And he said the kid never smiled. Everything they tried, you know, he got his stuff, it was the same. And then think about it, the war's been going on from 39 to 45, so five or six years, these kids probably don't remember candy. They've never had it in their memory. And so that may, that may be part of it. And so that was, a, a, again, a big deal for these guys. Deceivers are still uh, soldiers. And uh, these are from Arthur Shillstone. Now, Shillstone went on after the war, and he was an illustrator for Smithsonian Magazine, um, Sports Illustrated, um, 
National Geographic, among others, and uh, went on to quite a successful art career. So he takes what he's learned as an artist, takes what he's learned as a soldier, and then turned that into a uh, profession. So I wanted to go through a few of these simply because some of them you will have seen things that they did. So I thought about, okay, who made the biggest impact? Who made the biggest bang in their field? So the biggest bang in fashion and business is B Company 603rd Bill Blass. When he died, they talk about you know, his fashion empire and whatnot. Nobody talked about the fact that uh, he was one of the soldiers that went into Omaha Beach with the engineers. Five battle stars. It's, well, but he got to this icon, he got that medal. When Blast sold his empire, when he semi-retired, he sold it in one whack and in one chunk for $700 million, back when a million dollars was big money. He continued to work with other veterans, including for the, uh, go, the uh, World's Fair in, in Montreal in 1967. The guy in charge of doing the American exhibit at the World's Fair was one of the Ghost Army veterans. And classic, the US Information Agency cut his budget and they cut his budget again, but he still had the same task to perform. He started calling guys he had been in the Army with Blass and his company did all of the fabric work for the American exhibit. Other former engineers did design work and layout work and interior structural work. The dome itself, the geodesic dome, was uh, Buckminster Fuller, and the engineers knew Fuller. They went to him and said, hey, we, we hear you do geodesic domes. Can you do a really, really big one? That is still standing, and that's now the biosphere that stands in Montreal. So five or six of the engineers from the 603rd did that one. Ellsworth Kelly, artist. U.S. postage stamp was put out in his honor. Again, I haven't seen anything that mentions his time as an engineer. Um, he also has his own gallery at the Hirshhorn Museum in Washington uh, as part of the Smithsonian. Minimalist artist, probably the best known for that. Art Kane, photographer, also 603rd. That's a cover for a record from The Who, the group The Who from the 70s. Um, he took the picture and cropped it and set it all up. He did others. He's very famous for uh, photographs of jazz musicians in Harlem. I'm probably best known, which is why I kind of like that one. Arthur Singer, no stamp made for art, but he designed every one of those stamps. It is the most popular stamp series in U.S. Postal Service history. That's Seymour Nussenbaum. Seymour is still with us. A couple things for Seymour. He is irreverent and a pretty funny guy. So we have a picture. They got some uniforms and equipment, German uniforms and equipment. So there's a picture of a German SS officer. And the person in the uniform is Seymour. Um, and he thought it was ironic, and he had a good time with it. And um, some interesting how they, they came up with all the gear. Uh, they got it courtesy of one of the German refugees that was in the unit. And he called on some friends. He's like, hey, do you know where we can get any of this stuff? And, they said, oh, yeah, sure. So one of the guys he had been in the Boy Scouts with um, told them where the partisans had been hiding stuff, and off they went. If you ever had a VCR tape or VHS tape with a cardboard cover, probably manufactured, if not designed, by Seymour. He did thousands of them. Those four guys came into the engineer unit as a group. They're illustrators for comic books. Ray Harford down here, after the war, he still enjoyed getting together with his buds, but he decided to go work at a place called Marvel Comics for a guy named Stan Lee. So some of the early Marvel Comics stuff is actually Roy Harford from the 603rd. This is the work of Belisario Contreras. He used the GI Bill to get a PhD. Uh, widely misunderstood as an individual, he was thought to be a Mayan Indian. Uh, in fact, he was from Valparaiso, Chile, but uh, never corrected anybody on it. I guess he enjoyed being thought of as a Mayan. Um, 
he has his own style. He became famous both as an artist and critic after the war. This is the same scene done by another Ghost Army uh, engineer, Ned Harris, and gentler. Ned goes on to be the art director for several women's magazines after the war, and that was pretty much his career uh, after that. That's my stepfather. Uh, there he is in Normandy enjoying a bit of a, a break and a time from home. That's one of his sketches. After he died, I kept finding more sketchbooks. Uh, he did over 100 sketches, watercolors, full-up drawings. This is just a quick one um, af after they were pulled back at, uh, at the bulge. So, you know, he, he said he you know, did it in X minutes, just away. And a lot of the guys did it to relieve tension. There's a tremendous amount of art. And Amanda, you said that one of the things on our page is the Fort Leonard Wood painting. Okay, have to have to look at that. I hadn't seen that before, but I don't always keep up with what we put on our web our own website. This is Lieutenant Gil Seltzer. He turned 106 in October. He's still with us. He was an architect when he went in, and he is responsible for the, much of the look of the West Point skyline. He was the architect re, for the redesign of Thayer Hall, which, when he was done with it, was the largest academic building in the world. I taught in the systems engineering department. I did present le lectures on things other than this. Had no idea that one of the officers in my dad's unit had designed the thing. And nobody else, pretty, you know, he was, that was his arc. He didn't talk about any of it until after it was declassified in 96. This is Hal Lehner, the only one of the uh, group that I know of that has a museum named for him. Uh, Ellsworth Kelly has a gallery. He's got a whole museum. And you see the picture on the right. So there you are. You're an engineer soldier, and you get shot. And they, wreck, they evacuate you to Paris to, for your recovery. So he's recovering. He's bored out of his mind. A civilian comes wandering in. He's chatting with the soldiers that are, that are there. And... Uh, the guy says, what are you going to do when you, you know, how badly are you hurt? And, you know, what are you going to do when you get out of the Army? And he said, well, I was an artist, and I'm going to go back to being an artist. And the guy says, oh, hey, yeah, I'm an artist too. Um, when you get well enough to move, why don't you come down to my studio? Here's the address. I'll set you up with some paints and stuff. And, you know, let you get your mind off this. So he shows up at the studio, and the, the guy that's out there visiting, it's Pablo Picasso. And you can see from his pre-Picasso work to his post-Picasso work, much more Cubism, much more Picasso style. Actually, he's one of two of the Ghost Army soldiers that ended up in Picasso's studio. And that may be why he's got his own museum. I don't know. That's the biggest bang. That's Irv Meyer from the 406th Combat Engineers. He liked engineering so much that after the war, he went back, finished college in engineering, and he designed weapons for the rest of his career. And he is the, one of the key people behind this bit of, the, anybody know what that is? That's pretty obscure. It's a nuke. It's the Davy Crockett, the first Army tactical nuke. And among other contributions, uh, Irv did all the design for the rocket part of it. But they actually scaled down a fissionable warhead to the smallest size you pretty much can. So all the backpack nukes, et cetera, come from these guys and their original research. That's Atomic Annie. His team did the warhead for that. So he gets the vote for Biggest Bang. This is from a 1978 assessment. And it too, the minute it was written, got classified. So we didn't find this in the Army archives until much later. But there it is. And that's the brief history. There are so many elements to this, you can't believe it. Um, we are, we, uh, the governor of Missouri signed a thing last year 
making June 6th Ghost Army Recognition Day. So the first go around, the first time we're going to do it is going to be this next Sunday. And we were like, well, what do we do? So uh, the IMAX theaters at Branson have offered to uh, show the uncut version of our documentary film. And then I and the uh, daughter of one of the other soldiers, we're going to be there to do Q&A. One of the legislators from Missouri is going to be there to talk about you know, why they did it, the involvement of Missouri soldiers. Omar Bradley was from Missouri, for example. So all this is going on under his command. So, you know, for the big thing and the whole whatever, uh, I commend that to you. Ghostarmy, one word, dot org is our website for the Ghost Army Legacy product, uh, Project. And our mission is really because so many veterans and families have helped us put all this together. We want to share that. And in my case, given my background, I want to make sure the Army doesn't forget it. Because the Army forgot it absolutely for that 51 year period. And even after that, people were really slow to accept the fact that the Army really did it. Um, now the Army has done it. Uh, PSYOP, 4th PSYOP group is uh, in charge of that down at Fort Bragg. Um, and so they're taking it now into the 21st century. They're the people actually doing it. And uh, go, go check it out. They've got some cool stuff on their website too. Can I answer any questions? The Army did a very interesting thing. They, the standard camouflage course was created at Fort Belvoir by the Army. They then franchised it to universities. But with that franchising came a little thing. If you have any students that are really good in the course, give them this address to write to. You had to actually apply, if you're going to be a camoufleur, you had to apply and be vetted and accepted before you got into the 603rd engineers. And I think probably the other engineer units as well, the camouflage engineers. But specifically, I know the 603rd did it exactly that way. So they worked through university professors, which was a very common practice that the Army used up until the Vietnam War, and then everything kind of fell apart. But uh, uh, up until that point, there was a uh, quite a connection between the university system and the army. Um, and uh, that was part of why the human terrain team system was attempted, was to try and recreate some of that. And that, that's a whole other set of stories. But yeah, that's, so that's how you get them. And that was the primary method. Other questions? All right, well, thank you for inviting me in. Do appreciate it.